We've reached the part of the year that's not quite New Year's anymore, but still not spring. This is the time of year when Hollywood types begin to discuss one of the most coveted things that they award themselves with, the Oscars. On our end, this time of year is also home to the annual Crunchyroll Anime Awards, which are like the Oscars in that they are awards that people take far too seriously. Kind of like what I'm about to do right now. For both of these award shows, there is a category where the possibility of celebrating some great anime films exist. In the case of the Oscars, it's the Best Animated Films category. And for the Crunchyroll Awards, well, it's just Best Film, because everything here is animated. But both of these categories made a disappointing misstep this time around. One that I want to call attention to because I feel it's just a bit too egregious to ignore. Neither of these award shows gave even a nod to Mari Okida and her directorial debut of Makia when the promised flower blooms. At least with the Oscars, I can understand even if I'm disappointed. Mirai is a fine film and the Oscars have historically disliked anime, so really we should be thankful that an anime made it there at all. But Crunchyroll? Freaking Mazinger Z? Really? Ugh. So, ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection, where today I am going to do my best to explain to you why Makia is one of, if not the best anime film from 2018. Let's jam. To truly understand my love for this film, first we have to talk a little bit about the film's director. You might have heard her name mentioned out and about because Mari Okita has been involved in a number of high-profile anime over the past decade. She's been involved in many manga to anime adaptations, starting way back in the early 2000s with shows like Rose and Maiden, up until the early 2010s with Hanasaku Iroha and Anohana. Out of all of these shows, however, Anohana is the one she is most well-known for, and with good reason, as that series was not a mere adaptation, it was her own original work. Anohana, for those not familiar with it, and those who don't have the time to go watch my review on it, shameless plug, was an anime from 2011 about a group of teenagers struggling to remain together after the death of their good friend several years prior. The spirit of that friend then decides to come and interact with them again, in the hope that they would once again come together like they used to. It's an incredibly moving series that lands itself on my shortlist for anime that can make me cry just by listening to the soundtrack of specific scenes, because the story was so poignant. Another anime also capable of doing this was Toradora, which coincidentally was adapted for anime by Okida. The common trend that I have found here is that Okida is very good at showcasing relationships between characters. She is able to introduce us to them in a natural and flowing way so that we can learn a lot about them in a short amount of time and experience a kind of emotional journey we might not have had before. And this brings us to Makia. The film is about a fae-like girl who is torn away from her home and ends up raising a young human boy in order to cope with her loneliness and the loss of her family. Now, if you haven't seen the film yet, which is entirely possible due to its very limited theater run and the fact that it only came to home media very recently, then I will do my best to avoid spoilers for you, but the general premise is thus. We are introduced to the young Makia, a weaver from a very beautiful line of fae like beings who live in an isolated colony away from the rest of the world. They apparently live for hundreds of years and have mastered the art of weaving so that even the cloth that they create has intricate stories woven into them, which only they can read. Unfortunately, as with all innocent and fantastical things, these fae are coveted by the nearby human kingdom, who soon invade, looking to replenish the life of their fantasy clout, since their ancient dragons keep dying one by one. And what better way to preserve the royal line than to mix it with some magical blood, eh? The fools. During the attack, Makia escapes and comes across a nearby human tent, also destroyed by the invaders, which holds a single survivor, a young baby boy whom she names Ariel. The two of them set off in search of a new life. 
From this point, the story's focus changes multiple times. The narrative, as if to accentuate the fact that Makia and her kind live for a very long time, takes place over a few decades. We have several time jumps to show us the continued story of Makia and the young Ariel as he ages from a baby to a young man. It covers how Makia, though from a race of people with extremely long lifespans, is still only 15 at the start of the film and starts to struggle with the idea of motherhood, as she herself was an orphan with no real template to fall back on from a former family. It also focuses on the young Ariel, how he grows up in the care of Makia and how he deals with being adopted by her, how he feels about her, how he wants to protect her. Unlike some of her more famous work of previous years though, I wouldn't call Makia a love story, even if love is a very prominent theme. While there are plenty of references to romantic relationships and hints of that from various characters, the love of this film is more of a matronly love than one formed out of romance. This film is not some weird retelling of The Tale of Genji, where Makia raises Ariel to be her ideal partner, nor is it a Japanese version of The Lord of the Rings, depicting a similar love like that of Aragorn and Arwen. Makia's desire for Ariel is nothing more than to be the best possible mother that she can be, and she's constantly faced with self-conscious and anxious feelings about her parenting skills because she feels like she's never able to be the mother Ariel deserves. Her youth brings more difficulty to this because by the midpoint of the film, the two of them are, physically speaking, the same age by appearances and have to pretend to be siblings to keep Makia's heritage a secret. And already, by this point in our discussion, I feel like I have even loosely mentioned so many more kinds of themes and aspects to this film that I don't normally see in others. And I am barely scratching the surface here. There's just so much condensed into this narrative that even a minor summary of it could never do it justice. However, if I was to lay some criticisms on the film as much as I may love it, it would mostly come down to the sheer amount of development in such a short span of time. It was occasionally quite difficult to process all of it while also keeping track of the story as it progressed. The time skips are not made obvious, and sometimes trying to orient myself meant missing out on so many of the details that exist within each scene, and those are half the joy of it. It really is a film that is worth multiple viewings, just so that you can fully grasp all of those details, especially as far as the secondary characters are concerned. Hell, I'd consider some of the film's subplots to be even more interesting and intriguing than the main story, which is only a further testament to Okada's writing style. There is a lot of raw emotion on display, the kind that she is famous for, and the kind that I always love to see. None of the situations presented feel contrived or forced. Rushed at times, perhaps, but never in a truly negative way. It is difficult for me to properly describe my craving for this type of narrative, as I get such fulfillment from feeling this kind of strong emotional connection with the characters and the world that they inhabit. So to have all of that in this wonderful two-hour package has been an absolute delight. Returning to my initial point, though, about this being the film that awards forgot, I don't want to imply that this film is the one that 100%, without a doubt, was the best anime film from last year, even if I might consider it to be. Both Mamoru Hosoda's Mirai and Kyoto Ani's Liz and the Bluebird are very worthy contenders for the same title, mostly being decided simply by our own individual tastes and preferences. But for this film to not even get a mention, not a nod, that is the travesty in my mind. Because it's not only Okita that I feel got slighted by this, but also PA Works and every single member of the main staff. From Kawaii on the score to Toshiyuki's stunning animation, this may be a film touted as the first 100% Okita anime, but she did not work on it alone, and they all share in the film's success for making a masterful work that should stick in our minds for many years to come. If only we remember it. And I hope that we do. Because obviously, looking at these upcoming awards, some people have already forgotten. Thank you for spending the time to watch my thoughts on Machia when the promised flower blooms. I hope you enjoyed it. Normally, this would be where I mention some streaming links, though, since it is very rare for anime films to be available on streaming services. 
I unfortunately can't do that. I can, however, point you towards the home video release on Blu-ray and DVD by Eleven Arts in North America, as well as Mad Men in Australia and Anime Limited in the UK and Ireland. For alternate anime recommendations, for those who have seen the film, I will start off by just giving a blanket recommendation to pretty much anything that Madi Okida has worked on before, with specific mentions going towards both Anohana and Hanazaku Iroha. My second non-Okida recommendation that I will make today is another favorite anime film of mine that also happens to have a lovely motherhood aspect to it, Wolf Children. This is fitting considering Mamoru Hosoda's recent film Mirai has been getting media attention as of late, and I'll have to get around to making my video on it shortly, but Wolf Children has a lot of similarities to Makia, and there are enough shared themes to be enjoyable if you find yourself wanting more because of this film. And with all of those options, I hope that you find something to your liking. Lastly, a very special thank you to my patrons who not only support my work in general, but also allow me to do what I do. I love and appreciate you all. Specifically though, as I want to do and I like to do, I want to give particular shout outs to patrons Siri Amico, Rifen Bonaparte, Rune Jacobson, Joshua Garcia, and Calhoun Boy for being especially awesome. You guys are great. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime and stay frosty.